This episode of the Unbuild It podcast is brought to you by Huber Engineered Woods. When we uh, when we talk about Huber Engineered Woods, you know we say they make Advantech, we say they make uh, Zip System, and, you know they have uh, liquid flash and subfloor glue and tape. And I think that most of our listeners are fairly familiar with their product lines. They make really high quality stuff that makes our job easier. But I also wanted to let you know that they have a couple of new products on the market that they just announced at IBSX uh, for 2021. They have Advantech X Factor uh, and they have a new uh, vapor permeable tape. Uh, and I think that those things are very important because uh, they go to show what Huber Engineer Woods is really about. They're innovating and they're problem solving before even builders like myself have asked for those things. That process of innovation has kept them at the top of the game, at the top of the pile, and that process of innovation has caused... Uh, builders like myself who are focused on durability and energy efficiency and really doing things the right way the first time to believe in them as a company and to use their products. Uh, we've been using uh, their original Advantech formula since uh, the late 90s as a company and we've been using this Zip System since uh, 2013. So I think that that proves to you my belief in the company. I hope that you'll look into Huber Engineered Woods. uh, And thanks for sponsoring the podcast. Let's talk construction management software and what makes a software good. First, I'd say the ability to tackle the tasks that I needed to do. But more importantly, the ability for my team to comprehend the software, my clients to comprehend the software, and everybody involved to actually want to use that software or that interface. BuildBook could be that software for you. BuildBook is simple to learn and use. It allows for constant communication between you, your team members, and your clients. It doesn't waste time with unneeded features, and you won't have to send your team across country to learn how to operate it efficiently. At the end of the day, BuildBook should reduce your stress and your team's stress as well. BuildBook is an all-in-one construction software for today's builders. Whether you're a one-person operation or a large building crew, BuildBook has plans to fit your budget. They don't have any of those nagging sales calls or tricky upsells or hidden fees. You can sign up for a 10-day free trial with BuildBook so that they can teach you and show you what what the value is of their product. You should head over to buildbook.co to get started. Don't forget to mention that you heard it from us, the Unbuilded Podcast. That's buildbook.co. Thank you, Buildbook, for your sponsorship. Welcome to the Unbuilded Podcast. I'm your host this week, Pete Yost, and I'm joined again by Steve Basic. Hello, hello. And Jake Bruton. Thank you, Peter. And we've got a heck of a topic this week. It's the Foundations. Foundations 101. I don't know why we do 101 as opposed to 100, but it has or to be more of a ring. 101. What's the guy that wrote 101. like Pretty in Pink and, and Weird Science, all the uh, 80s high school? Is he a building scientist? No, that's the, you know, 101 is theatrically more interesting than saying 100 level. Plus, there's, there's a, a marketing value to three syllables. John Hughes. Right? That's why when you see like condo developments, it's Fox Run Trail or something. Uh-huh. Right. The but we digress. We... But we interrupt. 101. <laughs> Again, you what? volunteered to host and we haven't let you talk yet. <laughs> Herding cats is the current topic. But with foundations, we're up against a wall. There we go. Yep. 40 seconds. <laughs> That's, yeah. That's a pretty concrete statement. Oh, 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 nice, nice. I'll see you bad dad joke and raise you bad dad joke. <laughs> you just keep casting accusations oh. over there. Wow. The bear has been <laughs> awoken. <laughs> hey, both can go to hell. What, what? Let's, let's, start, let's start at the bottom. 
Oh, let's start at the bottom and work our way and up. And work our way up. There you go. Let's get a good foundation. There you go. So the important thing about foundations, I'm going to, it's hard to believe, but I'm going to be the one to set this thing back on the rails and get it straight. But the important thing about foundations is, as opposed to other things, is that you really only get one shot at it. I mean, if we do something above grade, we can move a window in a year. Yeah, it's a pain in the neck or whatever, or or redo a flashing or something. But to redo something in the basement is a hell of a task after we've backfilled and landscaped and the patio is in. And, uh, you know, this... This foundations episode, it really hinges on, you know, the, the work Peter and I, we just had our recent seminar from Home Building Crossroads where we talked about foundations. And uh, I thought it was uh, a pretty inspiring seminar in a sense that it was a, a pretty wide spectrum of information packed into that two hours. I mean, we didn't get into one just one detail of how to insulate basements or Um, what's the water management, it was kind of that overall thinking about basements. And, um, you know, one one of the interesting things, too, that came out of it was we got to talking about the current status of foundations where, as an architect, I find myself doing a lot of what I call hybrid systems, Hmm. where part of the house is crawl space, part of it is basement, or some of it's slab and basement, like the house that Jake and I did. But, uh, But you only get one shot. And that, that one shot is is really important, really important to get it right the first time from a planning standpoint, from an execution standpoint. It's also <clears throat> it's also the only thing that if we had to go back and do it again, that would absolutely involve heavy equipment. Right? Like that, just to escalate what you're saying, one more level, I can replace windows with ladders and carpenters. I can't replace, I can't remove a foundation without some sort of heavy equipment. Yeah, like, and you're wrecking is, a bunch of stuff that you have because chances are you either have a nice garden or landscape or patio or something up against it. And, you know, in that seminar, we had that one photo where I worked on a project where we excavated about 200 linear feet on the back of this house and side of the house and went down 16 feet, 8 feet wide and for that 200 feet because, you know, they had seven-figure basement um, finish down there in their home theater was getting wet floors and a whole bunch of things. And I told the clients, you're not going to like how we find out what the answer is, and you're certainly not going to like what it costs and the the order in which we repair it because all of that beautiful patio and stuff out back, we got to get under it somehow, and we got to get down there and find out what it was. And And the most discouraging part of it was, all the pieces for success, all the ingredients were there in the ground. They just were not executed. It wasn't done right. Nobody cared. And and hence, here we are. You know, I, I think it was the house was built like six years before we had to, five, six years before we had to tear it apart, which is really discouraging. I just was working with a builder and they sent a, a picture of a crawl space addition that was less than 10 years old. And... Um, that he sent me one photograph and it sort of said everything about what was wrong with the, um, the, the, the whole approach. But I said, well, what did they do? He said, well, we just tore the 10 year addition down because the problem was in the foundation. So the whole thing came down. So Steve's right. It's, you know, if we're, if this is what we're building the rest of the building on, we get one chance to do it right. And, and most customers think that, Crawl spaces and basements are supposed to be screwed up spaces that stink and are damp, and there's no reason for that. Yeah, no, exa- exactly. I mean, again, in one of the opening photos there, I put an interior photo, and the whole intention was to say, we're not building basements. Like, I mean, the, the house I grew up in, it had a dirt floor. It was a um, stone masonry foundation. And all the plumbing pipes, I mean, some of them hung. It had indoor plumbing? It had indoor plumbing, yes, yes. Um, That's surprising. You're a funny guy. But some of the plumbing pipes were like 12 inches below the floor joist just because they ran a pitch from that corner of the foundation across the wall. They didn't care if you had to duck under it or whatever or, you know, the smaller pipes ran over it. But that's just how it was. As a seller. 
Yeah. I mean, I can remember as a kid, like my, one of my happiest times was my mom going downstairs to do laundry. Cause I would go downstairs and at the bottom of the stairs was this little dirt pile. And I sat there and played with my trucks and stuff while my mom did laundry. So I had an indoor sandbox, if you will, down in the basement and I got to play in the dirt. It's yeah. You know, you get a little rain on it. Maybe that's oh, that the problem. explains a lot. Maybe, maybe that is the problem. But but is our, that a developmental issues? <laughs> our ex- expectations are. I, I, how can I have a serious conversation? You with can't. You two? But you know our expectations now are totally different. I mean, I've done crazy stuff in the basements. We, we've done home theaters. I've put in, you know, golf simulation systems in the basement. You know, one I was looking at recently. The guy wanted to put a batting cage in for his son. We're talking like twelve feet wide, eighty feet long. Um, I wonder at what point I get to batting cage and door money. <laughs> like, <laughs> who's thinking, do I already but, have a Ferrari? Wait, this or is, is the Foundation's one on one. We're not going to do batting cages. No, but the idea is that you know, especially in places like the Boston area where I come from, you can't you can't get twenty acres of land. So if you're looking to do something above and beyond, chances are you're going into the ground. That's funny. Above and beyond, you have to go down. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and it means that you have to pay attention to what you're doing down there and that it's it's really important with basements because you don't you don't get that second shot. So Foundations 101, what what are the primary things that we have to manage for below grade? Regardless of whether it's a slab or a crawl or a full base. Well, hold on. Before we go there, the one thing that we never talk about is the structural component. And we always skip over that when we talk about code and what code says, too. Like we've what do you, known what for do you a, guys think about ICF basements? <laughs> <laughs> but we've known for a long time how to make our things joke now. <laughs> not fall down. And so we, the three of us agree that like your engineer is going to take care of the don't fall down thing yeah, or code takes care of the don't fall down. So yeah. we don't have to talk about the not fall over part of, okay. I think that's a safe bet. So then we start with the things that are slightly more tricky that are like prescriptive cat path here or a, uh, you know, two word definition of the code where it's just like water manage, like those sorts of things where we, we have concerns when we bury things, just like you said, it's going to be hard to deal with in the future. So what are the things that we're concerned with after that? You know, I actually have an anecdotal story to this because I was sitting in the office the other day and this time one or the other. Well, didn't we go through this the other day? Yeah. I don't think he understands that an an anecdote is a story. So an anecdotal story is a story about a story. Do you still remember what you were going to say though? Yeah, I do. We can do that now if you want. Yeah. It's done being rude. (laughs) Just about. Okay, good. But no, this ties into the whole, like, how do you, with new employees and stuff, how do I deal with my daughter, Alexandra, coming in the office? But it was really interesting because we were having a talk about something, and I said, well, of course. I mean, you just run through the list of control layers, right? Water management, you worry about air, you worry about vapor, and then we worry about insulating it. She goes, but Dad, it's always that answer with you. It's so boring. And I tried to tell her. It doesn't matter if it's boring, if it's right. Exactly. I tried to tell her. It's like, it's it's the whole concept of this is building science, not rocket science. Keep it simple. Keep your approach simple. Keep your solution simple. And guess what? Keep the execution simple and things will be relatively simple and you'll succeed because you'll get them right. Don't complicate it. Don't overthink it. Don't. We don't have to do crazy details. So in answering your question... We run through our list of control layers. And, of course, water, number one killer. And groundwater is always a challenge. Well, that's the kind of I was driving to is that, you know, we've got groundwater table, we've got surface water, and then we got the load coming off the building. And when I get called into building investigations, it's, it's often very surprising that while there's a tremendous focus on the building load, how much of the water is coming off the structure, even that's not managed well. You know, the downspout comes down and there's no splash block leading away from the... Just yeah. really, really simple Kicks out things. three inches from the foundation. Yeah, yeah. Let's control all that water and dump it. Listen, right I, I have even a better one. I got called in. This was probably maybe a dozen years ago. A builder said, hey, I know you're into this building science thing. I have this client. I know you're into this building and, science uh, thing. He goes, can you come out? And they're having basement problems. So I go there. The house is literally in front of like a mountain of ledge. 
right? And you just see, you can see water like coming down. It was actually a rainy day. And you see water running down off the surface. You know water's migrating through it. And they're like, we don't know. We've already spent thousands of dollars. We put in a, a, a perimeter drain and we put in a dry well. And I was like, okay, perimeter drain's good. Where did you put the dry well? They're like, well, we put it right over there. I look over and literally the top of this thing is bubbling and water coming out. It's like, understand, you have a river coming down the this hillside hitting the side of the house. All you did was pump the river over there into the dry well. What makes you think that the water over there can all of a sudden take all that water and have it disappear and perk and it's 40 feet away so i think one of the one of the things that we don't really understand and what i'm trying to get to is the scale of problem in a basement is a lot larger than say water management of a roof right or a window those areas are small they're contained it's like okay if i solve for the window i push water away water goes somewhere but in the basement, just because I push it in the ground and move it over 40 feet doesn't mean it solved my problem. It just means that it's potentially saturating the ground over there at 40 feet, which means I have no place to put water on yeah, my it stops, property. It stops heading that way. Right. So it was... It's funny, too, because I was working with a client recently who was looking at initial design. And when I started to think about those threats to the basement, the first thing I looked at was the roof plan. Right, because the root plan tells you where the water's going. So even though we're talking about below grade, everything is connected to everything else. Grasshopper. Remember we went that was an epiphany, wasn't it Mom. you that we went to that house um out by me in Andover where we went in the basement and she's like, Oh, and the basement's leaking over here and made a mental note. And then we went outside like ten minutes later and you look at the side of this house and it's like valley cheek dormer all of this stuff and you came to realize the house was probably 120 feet long and it drained to about six feet and that six feet just so happened to be coincidentally the six feet where it was leaking and it just so happened to be the ground there sloped towards the house and was a lake right so it's it i mean it, it does amaze me that we can go to these job sites and stuff kind of slaps you in the face as like, are you, is this a joke? Like you're hiring me because you have a lake there. You look at the roof. You see where all the water's going. You don't have to hire a building scientist to understand. I need to put some gutters or do something and get that water the hell out of here. So just because we're below grade doesn't mean that we forget about water. It's still our number one concern after it's not going to fall down. Next, we manage for air. But I think it's even a, it's a worse concern, right? Yeah. I think it's a heightened Sorry. concern in the basement. Because if I give a, if the biggest fear is that you do a new house for somebody and they say, hey, we got water coming in the basement. Like if I got water coming in a window, OK, well, we'll, we'll come there, the we can tear the window, it pop it out and we can reflash it. You got water coming in the basement. You're you're in trouble. Yeah, you're in trouble. Big trouble. So then how do we manage for air leakage in a basement? How do you approach thinking about air leakage in a basement. So it's really interesting because in the early days for me, I had people tell me you can't use concrete as an air barrier. Now I tell them, go blow on, the, you know, put your lips on a foundation wall and try and blow through it. Good luck. Have you done it to verify? One yes, I actually okay. have. So trust, but, but, uh, but here's the, and here's the reality is we actually, I've done a couple houses now where we've lower door tested before we put the slab in. Now it wasn't the concrete, um, basement, but we did it before the slab and then we put, they cast the slab and we did a blower door number and they were virtually the same. Yeah. So where's it going to leak to underneath? Where's it leaking to? Yeah. I, I don't know, but air or ground is not as permeable as some people think. The eight year old that lives inside my brain's like, Oh, it's leaking all the way to China. Like it's going <laughs> all the way, all the way through. Think, yeah, it goes all the way through. And you're going to, you're going to smell low main in that basement if you turn the bath fans on high. No, that was a really bad joke, but but you get the idea. Low main was a good choice, though. <laughs> that was You could have picked things that weren't as quite as there funny. You there you go. There you go. I was trying to, trying to keep it surface oriented. So we're, we're not worried about air leaking through uh, concrete walls or a slab, I mean, uh, until they crack. And yeah. then, we're, then we're dealing with, 
you know, concrete to wood connections that are, you know, above the, grade. The transition points the, are important. Yep. Or if you put a window in the basement or something like that, certainly. But the concrete basement itself, I'm not. I mean, I guess the, the only place that you would worry about it is if you did a stone pad, cast the slab on top of it, and you didn't deal with a radon issue. Then you could potentially have radon coming through the cracks or around the edges of the slab. Which so, the code says we have to put down poly, a vapor barrier, moving on to our next topic, right? A vapor barrier below the slab anyway. Right. So, uh, you know, use a high quality poly product rather than like a four mil, which I think is the minimum that code requires because the second we spread it out, the concrete guy walks across its spread and rebar. So it's got a million I don't even know if you buy four mil, can you? Yeah. I always yeah. spec six mil, but four mils, that's like cellophane. It's right. not quite that bad. It's okay. not the 0.04 mil like the painters use, but okay, uh, yeah. But it's all, I, I believe that the code that that's all the code requires. Yep, and I think the code requires it as a vapor barrier too. So now we're on to control layer number three, right? Which yeah. is an easy one. That's an easy one. I mean, just control stop the underneath mi- migration of moisture from the ground upwards. Right, and now we've made it through. All the control layers except thermal. Yeah, I'll let you handle that because that's a good one. Well, we know the conductivity, thermal conductivity of concrete is pretty scary. And so um, we're going to make sure that we boost our value from the concrete alone to something else. But Like ICFs? <laughs> yes, like ICFs. You get an R200 if we put an RC- ICF wall in. <laughs> I heard they were making them in 350 now. <laughs> So the question is, okay, you're talking about ICS where you can put the insulation on both sides of the concrete wall, but what if you have to choose one or the other? I'm an inside guy. And you? If I could figure out a way to put it in the middle of the concrete wall, where we had concrete on both sides of it, that might be good. That might be my optimal. There actually was a But that seems pretty damn system. expensive. And like I'd have to pay for a lot more concrete because I'd be putting sure. two pretty sizable concrete walls on either side of my insulation. So I'm going to stick with Steve on this and say I'm putting it on the inside so I can protect it, inspect it, repair it, or replace it. Wow. That was like speed talking. Um, but I, I had a uh, conversation with a structural engineer, and he said the, the minute you put the foam in between, you have effectively built two four-inch yeah. walls. So the structural nature of let's hold it up, becomes a different dynamic now because you have two walls that don't have composite action. Even just the formwork becomes more the formwork the is a, a nightmare. You know, and and let me go back to my rant. Keep right? it simple. Keep it simple. But something always has to be the worst part of the wall. Why should we spend an extra ten thousand dollars trying to figure out how to save five dollars a month and yeah. using the inside of the wall? as some type of heat sink, which, I mean, I, I'll let Peter, you, you can certainly talk more about slabs and heat sinks, but I mean, I've honestly never really believed in using the slab to my advantage. If we did a slab on grade, people say, oh, you know, I see you put the, a hardwood floor and insulation on top of the slab. That's a really dumb idea. You should have used the slab as a heat sink. And this is in a 2,600 square foot house that has a heating load of, you know, 4,500 BTUs a year, you know, it's, it's crazy. Well, yeah. And so in terms of foundations one-on-one, what we're saying is, yes, you can put the insulation on the outside of the wall or the inside. And it, it, anytime you pull a mass into the building, you can make more use of it than if you push it out. But it's just so annoying to have to deal with that insulation on the outside of the concrete wall that it's much more uh, manageable to do it from the interior in terms of uh, slabs and trying to either pull them out or push them out all i want is one or the other right if if you're going to pull that slab in pull it completely in and if you're going to push it out push it completely out and steve you have plenty of details where it's not sometimes all that easy to do that total exclusion or total inclusion but you've succeeded with your D-shells. Yeah. I mean, we I've done a series of hybrid systems. Jake and I did a house where, you know, the homeowners, we didn't feel a need to do a 3,000 square foot basement. So we did an 800 square foot basement inside the 3,000 square foot perimeter of the house that handled 
everything that we needed it to handle. All the plumbing, all the heating and cooling lines and duct work. Storage. And 800 square feet of storage. I mean, that's a couple storage cubicles at the warehouse down the street, right? So you don't, if you need more than 800 square feet of storage, then you maybe, you know, might you be thinking you need away. less stuff, not more space. So again, I'm happy that my wife doesn't listen to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to me, what's interesting is I, I came into this one on one with the idea that I'm going to ask you each which foundation system you recommend the most often. But I know now your answer is going to be probably a combo approach. Yeah, it might it might depend on because it, there's there is the argument for a basement. Even if I'm doing a totally slab on grade house, it would be cool to get the 300 square foot basement underneath the stairway because there are things like where do I put the water heater right it stands 60 inches tall if you're doing a hybrid water heater it needs 700 square feet of communicable area for it to do its job and and then if you put it down the hallway and you put a louver door on it then you got to listen to it so then it becomes an acoustical challenge and it's still in your space and and it's still in your space and you know, one of the one of the things that I think is pretty cool right now is there's a migration in how we're thinking about the spaces in our house and what requirements. I've I've done I don't know probably a half a dozen houses in the last couple of years where the people wanted root cellars. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are doing more farming, more like That's getting their clients. own. Yeah, well, yeah, and. But but the beauty of that is that causes the need for, hey, let's just go down and let's do this basement. I'm doing a project in Texas right now. It's going to have, I don't know, probably about a 600 square foot basement. And part of it's going to be root cellar. So we'll, we won't put the slab there. We'll have that space communicate with the uh, space above. But the beauty of that is now I have a home for one of the air handlers. I have a home for the hybrid hot water heater. And even if I put a louver door, it's so displaced in distance down the stairs and around the corner that you're really not going to hear it. And it's underneath the laundry room and the powder room. So the master bedroom is on the other side of the house. So there's a lot of advantages to putting that, that small piece in there. And I'm actually doing one now, a house. It's a retrofit, but we're communicating the ground to the space, and we're going to do a kind of ground-controlled wine room. So That's funny, because when you mentioned root cellar, I thought the other special environment that people want to put in areas like a foundation system is a wine cellar. And you get asked all the time, like, well, you know, it doesn't make problems with moisture. And it's just a special environment. We create special environments all the time inside buildings. It's just that you have to control that space. Speaking of special environments, I thought it was pretty cool that I came to a house in Missouri, certainly tornado country, and I see a slab on grade. And I'm thinking, hey, Auntie M, where where does she stay? (laughs) And uh, you just took a space above grade and made it a safe room perfectly dimensioned for, you know, your needs. So you said, I, I don't need a whole basement for that. I can make an above space with yeah. safe. Plus the house that you're talking about is uh, in floodplain. So we didn't have an option to go yeah. down. Ah. Anyway. So even if we wanted to, uh, we still were, you know, we had like, I think we're, we could be 16 inches lower than what the slab wound up on that house. That was it. And we turned it into an aesthetic feature because mm-hmm. you did yeah, board, board form, form concrete. concrete. So it's something cool to look at. Yep. In the house. Yeah. So it's, you know, why not take advantage of that opportunity? I'm also designing a house right now down in Alabama, which is definitely tornado Roll country. Tide. And uh, what's that? Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Uh, <laughs> yeah. War Eagle. That's for my son, Steve. Um, but uh, downstairs, the husband said, you know, there's, there's times where the uh, tornado sirens and stuff, they're going off for like six, eight hours. And he goes, it's actually annoying because, like, you have to run downstairs. And then, okay, you go upstairs for an hour. And, and then, oh, you got to run downstairs again. He's, so we're building a room, basically a little suite down there. It's going to be a, a room that it's like 10 by 10. It's very modest. But they're going to have a small bed in there, but it's attached to the powder room in the basement. That's part of that assembly. 
And what that allows them to do is the sirens go off. They're just going to go down there and go to sleep. And and they have a bathroom inside there. They shut the the storm door, and they're in a storm shelter. And they have a bathroom with that's contained inside the storm shelter. And then they probably have television. They can watch the Wizard of Oz they, while they're there. Exactly. There you go. Sounds very dungeony. Like so. The thing that's cool to me about this one on one is that we've just now moved through probably three or four different climate zones. Talked about pretty much every type of foundation system, from full basement to cross to slab. I know one of your recent projects has an incredible peer system as well. Um, so the thing I like about the way that you two have approached this is it's like we, we don't feel compelled to be confined to any one foundation system. We just use each one for the benefits and make sure we honor the control layers along the way. Which is exactly what builders and architects do. The, the opposite of what we're talking about here. They go, we're a slab market. Right. Right. Everybody get gets locked into Everybody's a walk out in our market. market. Why wouldn't you look at what the needs of the client and the site dictate and then make decisions based off of site conditions and client needs and then design something that works for their budget, their needs, their aesthetic, whatever it is, and, and react the same way you do with the rest of the house? Like if you're building custom homes, there's still plenty of people that will let you do just about anything you want in the house, but... The conversation starts with, okay, so we got to walk out and then, and it's so weird that we do that. I don't know why that is. Yeah, but I, I think it, it gets to that asking the right questions, right? Yep. I mean, I just, I did that house on the water where we actually did what I called the sport garage underneath the screen and porch. And we have a garage door. So when I take people up there, they're like, you have a garage under here? How do you, there's no driveway. How do you get a car here? And I'm like, it's not that kind of garage. It's a sport garage. They're like, what do you mean sport garage? I'm like, we have two docks down there on the water, 50 feet away. This is where we house all the kayaks, all the tubes and water skis and everything associated with the water sports. They're in here in the sport garage. And they're like, oh, wow. You know, but to, to have that as part of the basement, it's asking the right questions and, you know, having a chat with your clients about what are their needs. So the moral here is you need a dry space to store all of your watercraft. I like water that. Water sport toys. Water sport. The watercraft are still in the water. It's everything that's associated with that. Make yeah. sure the water skis dry out. Make so sure we, the kayak is dry. We've Where talk- do you store your kayak? In my garage. Oh, so you put a wet device underneath the roof to keep it dry. <laughs> Thank <Busted>. you. <laughs> so we talked mostly just now about basements. And we talked kind of just in theory of how we handle it. Uh, can one of you, uh, and this is obviously leading, can one of you define crawl space for me quickly while we're still on the foundation topic you know it's funny when we did a, one of the slides we I have a crawl space that's zero inches tall and then i have one that's 10 inches tall then 20 inches tall and by the time you get to the four foot tall it's like that looks like a short basement <laughs> i have one requirement for a crawl space it's about 24 inches and the reason is that's what i need to roll over in there so if i'm belly crawling across there and, and you I want to look up directions? at something okay. or change direction i need to be able to roll over down there so that's the only requirement that i have See, i would add a second requirement uh i don't i don't believe in the last 10 years we've done a crawl space that also didn't have a rat slab in it that we also didn't then just go ahead and pour even though it's sloppy you know raked around concrete that's just quickly trialed there's no trial finish there's no you know great care because we're trying to keep our costs down uh i don't think i would do one without that having done it enough times now it's it's funny because peter and i have a a mechanical contractor friend jim finnegan remember stephanie's husband well part of his toolkit he was an hvac contractor so his part of his toolkit was a uh creeper automatic automotive repair creeper and an office chair and the creeper the office chair just were the differences in basement heights in New England. 
Like a lot of times he would be able to sit in a chair because the crawl space was, you know, five feet tall. So he would just scoot around on his chair and do all his work. Or sometimes it was too low and he'd have to do everything from the, um, from the creeper. So now we've connected foundation systems to watercraft and automobile repair. We are really good at spectrum analyzing a situation. I'd call it lack of focus, but okay, sure. What if, what you but to? okay, so let's, for all you listeners out there and viewers, right, please write in. Do you like Jake's lack of focus as our title or my spectrum analyzation? I, I think that's a really good place to end Foundations <laughs> 101. Well, we can well, certainly pick up Do more. we have anything else to add on it in, in our 101? I, I, no. I pay mean, attention. I, I think, I, I mean, we, we could talk about this for hours and hours, and I think we can come back, but I think this is a really good kind of surface-oriented um, talk about what happens below grade. There you have it. And with that, Jake's going to do the wrap-up from a social media perspective. <laughs> Follow each one of us on Instagram. Steve is Stephen Basic Architect on Instagram. Building Right on Instagram, right? Building Right, Peter, Peter, I think. But not really that out to show. Let tag below. Jake Dubrutin on Instagram. Peter is alive. Don't forget to follow the podcast on Instagram. If you are listening on uh, just the audio version of the podcast, please leave us a five-star review on uh, iTunes. That's how we... Uh, show up to other people that we are a word of mouth only. We don't do any paid advertising or anything like that. So your review, your comments actually help us grow the podcast, get this information to more people. Don't forget to subscribe and then subscribe down below to the YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube and don't forget to click the little bell so that you get a reminder every time we, I don't know why that was so funny, but it was (laughs) every time we post a uh, new video, it will show up and you'll get a reminder for it. And uh, don't forget to tell a friend. This is how we grow the podcast and we get to tell more people about what we're doing here and why yeah. we're sharing. And make sure you check out those videos. We're, we, we shot a whole bunch of them today, you know, out at some projects and just a lot of great information we're going to be throwing up there that you can just go check out, see what we're up to, what we're doing, what current projects we have. There will great be stuff. new content every week, so it's worth subscribing. So. Thank you for watching. Thanks, everybody. Alrighty.